it's uh, it's a, it's a pleasure and a privilege uh, to to have a chance to uh, to take part in this event. Uh, I hope uh, it might be maybe a, a bit helpful, or if not helpful, then uh, at least interesting or funny in some ways. Uh, what I what I have uh, prepared is uh, a few slides and and a few stories on uh, uh, how I actually uh, got to the point where I'm now and how my Czech Polish heritage basically helped me uh, getting there. So let me share the screen. My primary uh, area of uh, experience or expertise is social media, uh, which as you might know yourselves, or, or, you, or it's basically quite easy to guess, uh, is, is a very localized stuff. Um, I, I would even say like uh, trying to, to work as a social media specialist doesn't really matter whether you're you know creative uh, agency or, or you're a customer care agent or whatever it is, uh, this is one of those very hard to uh, try outside of your country. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that uh, in, 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 let's say, the second part. Uh, but I would, I, would, I would like to start that with, with two major ways how to get uh, to a cross-border cooperation or, or business. One, A, is, is that you offer services or products which are totally interesting elsewhere, not just in your country. And you can also offer them easily. So you either it's a service you can, you can deliver remotely or, or you can easily send it uh, and so on. Or B, which is the social media part for me, but it's definitely not just social media, is something that goes a different way. And that means you're looking for international corporations, but you sell your local know-how uh, for clients from outside of your market because they know they, they don't really have it and they need it in, in <clears throat> so, so they can basically get to the local market in the right way. Uh, I'm quite sure, you know, many examples yourselves uh, how badly it can end when you try to uh, for for the go to market without the right preparation and uh, ignoring the local context just translation is never never enough so the but but let's start first with the with the first uh, idea. Do I have something I can offer uh, in other countries? And in the Czech Republic, uh, I think this is uh, something that people were not that often trying to do. Uh, especially not as freelancers. On the other hand, as Czech Republic is not really a, a huge country, in, in many regards, we do have companies that went global uh, and that they were basically uh, doing going this direction from the very, very beginning because they knew that the local market is, is basically too small. When I compare this with Poland, which is my, uh, like, let's say, second market I, I probably know a bit about, or you can you can probably compare it to to, to many 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 other big countries or bigger countries. In Poland, you can you can kind of survive uh, on the local market, and so I think more, more startups, for example, from from Poland, they are first trying to reach some kind of uh, some level of experience and, and maturity on the local market 
before thinking about going global. Uh, in the Czech Republic, and there are several industries and verticals where this is kind of uh, very, very strongly seen. Uh, you, you have to start big because the Czech Republic itself is basically uh, too small. Uh, I probably never really mentioned this, uh, but my very first project, which was international, uh, it's, it's kind of funny stuff because it's like ages ago, that was in 1999, uh, when there was still the era uh, when music was composed in so-called trackers, which were kind of programs in which you, you can compose music using samples, but not MIDI, but uh, samples which were part of the file which you sent in the end as a result. But it was before MP3s, and uh, those uh, files were basically small because they were only comprised of the samples. They were not recording of the sound. And you have to have the program to open it and then play the samples in the right way, which was the second part of the file. So you had samples and you have how to play them. Uh, this was kind of popular thing back in the late 90s. And it was popular all around the world. And people were gathering in so-called uh, uh, groups, which were not like groups in, in terms of <laughs> music groups, but groups uh, comprising of, of people with uh, similar uh, musical taste. Uh, while I was unable uh, I'm not a musician. Uh, I was a huge fan of this, but I was unable to uh, to add anything myself because uh, you know I couldn't really compose anything. Uh, so I thought, how can I, you know, take part in all this? And so I decided, okay, let's let's create a review site. So so I created an English uh, review site where uh, I, I publish eight reviews uh, twice a month. Uh, and that was it. And we hanged out around IRC. If you, you know, IRC Internet Relay Chat, that it was, you know, before ICQ and before Messengers and so on, kind of chat place uh, where, where the musicians were. And I felt I'm, I'm part of the community and I'm, I'm, I'm giving something to the others and it felt great. And I also, you know, I also got way better with my English uh, uh, because in, in the beginning that was nothing really special. And I made friends around the world and I felt, you know, that that was the, the kind of moment when you realize that the internet really, really gives you the chance to do something big and something international because, uh, yeah, because uh, I could, you know, just download the music which was composed the same day somewhere in Sweden and I could chat about it with people from all around the world. And it was kind of very underground scene, uh, but it, but it felt, uh, felt very, very interesting. Uh, I was doing it for two years with quite some people uh, being later as guests, musicians usually. Uh, and I loved it, but in the end, uh, you know, it was time to move on. And also MP3s were taking over and I basically didn't like the thing because these modules, so-called modules were open sourced. You could look inside and see how it was done how it was composed, how the samples go one by each other, which you obviously can't do uh, with MP3s. So that was that was many many years ago, but it was kind of a kind of an opening moment for me to to understand the the power uh, of of cross border cooperation. Anyway, when we go back to the business, uh, the problem is that. Uh, trying to uh, 
get the advantage of uh, better, uh, you know, cheaper, cheaper, you, you give cheaper labor uh, to companies in, in US or Scandinavia. Uh, it's something that might have worked long time ago. It's something that still might work for some, and you know, let's check out Fiverr, and 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 you would see that, yeah, it probably works still for somebody. But uh, it's an extremely uh, tough uh, race because the competition is high, and your labor price is cheaper than in the US, but still there are Philippines or Morocco or other countries in the third world, and they are going to be even cheaper. So you can't really, even, even on Fiverr, I think uh, probably most of those how-to guides will tell you that competing by price is uh, not the way to go. So I have these LinkedIn requests like, like this one from Robert from India. Uh, you know, we can do anything and we all, we do websites and mobile apps and development. And yeah, and you, you see India calling and you are like, no, uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, cold calling is uh, something that might work if you have like a really, you know, uh, the whole process in place and you spend a lot of time sending these requests and probably someone someday, you know, will care. It's like from train spotting. Hope that someone somewhere cares uh, and i definitely wouldn't recommend this as as a strategy especially for newbies or, or freelancers in general because i think uh, uh it's it's a very rocky way and the quality of the leads is probably nothing special if you do have something which you can you know, which is something really special, finding your niche. And I think that's kind of uh, supports what uh, uh, Barbara has said. Uh, that's, that's, I think, uh, something totally different. And uh, this is an example uh, of a from from a from a Czech tattoo artist, he's quite famous, and he's definitely not famous just in the Czech Republic. I would even say uh, his you know foreign base of followers is is much higher than the local one, and his waiting list is full for years. And it's filled with people going even from a different continent to Prague uh, to have a session with him. Uh, like always, this, this usually starts small and, and you simply grow your way organically. Uh, the lead generation in this, in this uh, situation you know, it's like we, he's already a very successful guy, but uh, it's his own social media channels, in, in this case, Instagram. Uh, it's, of course, personal recommendations because that works best. And, you know, while here, Robert, I don't really have any idea why I should care. Should I be Andras' customer or? Uh, then I will probably, you know, not be alone uh, in my surroundings. And of course, it's it's being mentioned in relevant spaces. So uh, I believe this is kind of uh, very typical for uh, 
creative guys who have this this kind of uh, um, background that it's combination of their own channels, uh, word of mouth, and uh, mentions in, in, in very targeted uh, places and publications. Another, another example, uh, which is kind of my uh, close to my heart, is uh, handmade jewelry, because Aira Handmade, uh, that's my sister. Uh, while Anna Ray Jewelry uh, is a friend of her and also a daughter of uh, a long-term uh, <laughs> freelance guru uh, in the Czech Republic, Marek Prokop. Anna is now in UK, but uh, her business was doing very well yet before she decided to, to relocate. And... Both both these stories, like Anna is is, is definitely uh, uh, a, a bigger star these days. While my sister had has had two kids, and so she was not working as much on on her brand, and that's something that's still in front of her these days. But it shows that uh, the the best way is to to find the right niche uh, in in her in my sister's uh, stuff you can see the hourglass pendant and it was actually this hourglass pendant which also uh, not probably exactly this one but another one which won some kind of uh, uh, international competition and so she was featured uh, in some US magazines and that brought her uh, actually several clients uh, who were looking just after this. So they were like, yeah, this is something uh, I really love and would it be possible to make me my own hourglass pendant? Of course, a different one. Uh, each one is very, very different. They are all originals. But the idea uh, is still the same. And it was something that stood out. So while you, you have to uh, be prepared that, you know, Etsy, as, as other like huge international marketplaces, be it of things like Etsy is or labor, like fiber uh the competition is, is brutal really brutal uh extremely big but the public is also you know uh so big that compared to what what you can gain in the czech republic fighting your slice of uh the cake that your your share of voice might be very interesting and you know with uh people uh like jewelry makers are who are you know limited in what they can uh create in any amount of time uh it kind of makes sense to go for the big arena and hope that you can you know end up producing just so many hourglass pendants but you can probably sell them for more uh, on Etsy than you can do it on on your local chick market, uh, and it and it you know and it's gonna work. Then one thing I would I would kind of especially uh, highlight here uh, is that in different countries you most probably have some kind of local hubs or nodes or whatever you call it. And these are, uh, you know, it doesn't, you, you don't have to go to Silicon Valley uh, in order to find one. Of course, Silicon Valley is one of the greatest hubs or nodes 
when it comes to creativity and startups and so on. Uh, but there are thousands of micro hubs and in very different niches. There are probably uh, many others who are actually for your niche, it might be more important place is, is somewhere else and it doesn't have to necessarily be US in general. And so uh, there are a few examples a well, couple of examples in which I believe Czech Republic has some kind of uh, significant concentration of knowledge and people who are into it, which again helps to, you know, whenever you have the community, uh, it helps to, to, to uh, create more value. So my favorite examples here uh, it's it's crypto or blockchain or whatever you call it. Uh, Prague was, you know, crowned as most uh, crypto friendly city in the world. Uh, Trezor.io or Slashpool. These are big names uh, in the crypto uh, crypto community, both based in Prague. Robert knows them very well because Paralonipolis. One of the hubs in, in Prague in Holeshovice was, I think, the first place in the world where you can't pay for your coffee by nothing else than just uh, crypto. And so, so that, that kind of community definitely helps then others who are interested in the, uh, in the same space. It's computer games. Czech Republic, I think, is, you know, it's probably not the world's best place to do computer games but it's definitely something that you know we are good at uh and beyond average <laughs> uh when compared with other countries of you know uh, similar size antivirus companies czech and slovakia were hosts of uh, avg avast and asset uh so like three of Top five, I think, antivirus companies were uh, Czech or Slovak. And that goes, again, not just, you know, these days, these are not just antivirus companies, uh, but let's say computer security in general. And I think uh, we are, we're, again, quite good in this. And 3D print, uh, you might know Prusa, Josef Prusa, the creator of Prusa 3D, uh, one of the leading manufacturers. And again, Having such guy around uh, helps everybody else uh, who's more into this uh, to feed on it. Uh, the thing is, uh, quite often these things are too new to be recognized by, uh, let's say, the government or uh, you know any any uh, official media until they are too big to be ignored. Uh, which is usually way later than, than you know what's what's really going on. But for you as a freelancer, I think it's it's very interesting to find these local hubs, which are not interesting only because of the local concentration, but also because they uh, they can uh, connect you with people from abroad who are coming because they are kind of. Uh, lured by what's what's going on or if your hub is elsewhere you can do it the other way around so you can you can leave your country and go elsewhere to just grip what's going on in here and then maybe transfer that kind of knowledge uh back home and still be in touch with uh people uh from the original hub because that that helps so now, now I now I come to the second part, and that's uh, that's the stuff uh, which is my case basically. So how to how to work with uh, the stuff you you can't really translate, but you have to localize it. Here it's the difference between translation and localization, which you might know yourselves very well. Uh, Social media and uh, localization 
not translation that's that's like uh, uh, a very uh, long and often sad story. But in my case, that that's something that helped me go over the borders because I was able to sell the local knowledge to people from outside of the Czech Republic uh, when they were looking for that. So here is uh, here is uh, for for Czech speakers that might be uh, mm, that might be easier to understand. Uh, this was the start of my let's say full scale career when I was just after finishing the university with. I, I studied journalism and media studies. Um, I uh, I had my final thesis as as a web page. It was about Web 2.0, and I published it uh, on my domain. So it was bhuk.com slash Web 2.0. It's still there. And when I was thinking about what should my final thesis be about and you know i'm these days i'm trying to uh whenever i have the chance to talk to the students i try to convince them that a final thesis is not just uh, a test or a waste of your time or you know misery days spent trying to you know write something which you then just stuff somewhere and, and you get rid of it and you're most happy to just forget about the suffering and it could be something that actually uh, has some kind of value <laughs> not just for you but hopefully uh, for others as well and if you spend so much time doing such a project, which is often the biggest project so far, uh, it's challenging and so on, then be proud of it and do something uh, you, you believe is worth the, the time spent. In my case, I was writing about Web 2.0 because it was something that you know amazed me uh, I had a part about uh, Google ecosystem, about Wikipedia, about uh, Last FM, about Delicious, the uh, bookmarking service, and MySpace because Facebook was still kind of a uh, newcomer to the Czech Republic at the time. So there was probably one page about Facebook and 15 pages about MySpace. And I was happy to, to finish it. Uh, I was happy to put it out. And some people read it and recognized it. And in my case, it was, I hoped it might be a ticket to get to Google uh, where I applied for a position. And who knows, maybe it would have worked, but I don't know because when I was in the process of interviews and I had like six interviews uh, in Google behind me, I was approached by MBank. And MBank was a Polish bank. It, that was, of course, a uh, uh, <laughs> benefit for me that it was from Poland, looking for a web marketing specialist. In this uh, picture, that's their... Uh, uh, they are at uh, headhunting uh, a PR uh, specialist or, or uh, uh, speaker, which is translated, not localized. So the uh, yeah, the sentences are okay, but. It's just horrible. No wonder MBank had have had really struggled was really struggling to get get people on board. 
it was a Polish bank with Poland not being, you know, the love brand for uh, Czech people, especially not in banking. Uh, it was having these horrible, horrible ads. And, and they just felt odd. And to, for me, it was one of the life-changing experiences because I, I, I thought I'm approached by a bank while I was approached by uh, a bank startup, and it was uh, it was it was a ride. I was there for two years, and uh, being able to speak Polish fluently helped me every day. Uh, then I left because uh, the bank kind of left its own um, course in a in a way with the founder of the bank which i would kind of uh, say it was steve jobs of m bank when he left uh uh the bank was carried on by people who, who didn't really adhere to to the values uh in the first place so not just me but many of my colleagues left as well and i was in other companies and basically in each each of the next steps uh speaking polish was somehow helpful uh in some cases it was because the the, the company had has had some some polish part uh in the case of roi hunter which is uh, a very successful uh facebook ads based startup combining data from facebook google and your own you know crms together I was opening the, the Polish market or, or helping to open the Polish market for them. Uh, up to the final, final stages. Um, I, was, I was in MBank, I was in Atexo, and then I went freelance. And that was in uh, 2012, uh, in, the, in the very beginning on, on 1st of January, 2012. I officially left H1.CZ agency and moved to Brno, or well, I moved to Brno half a year uh, earlier, but that, that was it. I was in Brno. And I knew that I'm uh, a person that it's, uh, uh, it's kind of hard for me to find uh, a place in a company to be employed because I didn't want my you know my position to drop compared to prague but most of the potential uh employees employers employers were in prague and remember in 2012 uh the situation with uh, let's say uh, the idea that you know i would work remotely was definitely somewhere else than than what what you know now so I set up on, on a project already in 2011 and wanted to create something which would help me with my uh, freelance career. But uh, before I really could start it, uh, it was LinkedIn that helped me and it was the search for local knowledge uh, that landed me a job uh, working for BMW. Uh, here you can see Olena uh, from iCrossing Germany uh, was looking for a freelancer uh, who would be in charge of the local page because they knew very well that uh, you have to have uh, the local the local know-how and that it's something you can't do directly from Munich. And that was it. For next six years, starting April 2012 till April 2018, I was in charge of all social media channels of uh, BMW Czech Republic, which was 
again, a great experience with uh, one of the most interesting Pilaf brands you can, you can basically work for as a social media manager. The plan, which was uh, set yet before I was approached by BMW, was actually different. The idea was, let's create something and that something was called Babel Guide, which was uh, a, a great job by, by my good friend and branding guru, uh, Adam Hrubi. Babel Guide, because CE is kind of Babylon, you know, Babel. And Guide, because we'll guide you through that. And Babel Guide was my attempt to answer the following problem. When you speak to social media professionals, and I'm quite sure that this doesn't apply only to them, but it's like more common issue. Uh, if, you, if you talk with uh, similar minded professionals around you and you know whatever your field of expertise is, then they do tend to know each other locally within one country. Plus, they probably, those who are, you know, more into that and want to get, you know, some work on, on their own education, etc. They probably tend to read some extra content in English. Now, with Mark being a native speaker, I, I, I'm afraid it's a different story. But if you are from a CE country like Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Austria, it's kind of, you know, stupid thing that we all tend to read either local stuff or U.S., based stuff most of it is like us based when it comes to social media it's it's striking how much of what you can get either officially from from the companies themselves or from you know different news sites it's pretty much all us based and the problem is that the us market and our market are completely different so what might work for U.S. customers and U.S. freelancers will most probably not work in, in case of uh, your local country, either because it's, you know, sometimes it's not even implemented. So, okay, I, I see that there are some new things coming out, you know, from Facebook or Instagram in the U.S., but hey, I have no idea when or whether it's even coming to the Czech Republic. Uh, there are, of course, uh, plus, yeah, of course, plus the market is totally different. The uh, way people do business is different and so on. And learning about what's going on in countries which are close to you like, you know, in the Czech Republic, we still have some connection with Slovakia because, you know, there's a lot of Slovak people in the Czech Republic, their languages are uh, basically, you can understand each other well. So that works to some extent. At least you have, you know, plenty of Slovak people in the Czech agencies and in, in the Czech business in general. So they, they bring the Slovak experience. Uh, but but when it comes to Hungary, mm, we don't know. When it comes to Poland, mm, we don't know. Germany, same thing. So the idea here was to connect social media professionals from the neighboring countries, write in English, write uh, content which would be you know long reads, interviews, and which would somehow connect uh, the people who, who would be interested in this kind of uh, interchange of experience. 
And the problem is that this is, you know, easier said than done. Uh, and basically you can't do it on your own. Even for, you know, it's, it's, it would be a, a full-time job to, to do it properly. And I, I, and I, of course, didn't have time for that. But the idea that you can somehow put together the content and it will bring you in the end some kind of leads is, I still believe that it's still valid. Uh, the problem is I was not the right person for the job. And the problem is that I'm lazy. So when I realize that I don't need to do that because I have enough, you know, enough uh, inquiries and enough uh, work without it, I basically gave up. But because connecting people, which was part of the part of the whole idea, uh, is something that's actually the, the the driver of my, let's say, professional life or career. What I the fact that I ended up as social media professional is basically in a way by an accident, right? It's a way how to connect people and get paid. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. But uh, most probably I might be, should, should I have been born 10 years earlier? I might have ended like, you know, journalists or journalist or or some kind of uh, business advisor maybe I don't know no idea uh, so I still wanted to connect with uh, other people and that was in 2012 when bar camps were uh, something at least in the Czech Republic that but but I think in, in other countries as well uh, something that really uh, was catchy it was on its wave. And so I thought, okay, it's like everybody's doing bar games. Let's, let's create one more, but let's make it differently because 95% of the bar games were in Czech for a local audience. And the idea was, okay, let's, let's do it all in English and do it concentrating on, on just this uh, niche uh, community of social media people. And so we did that from 2012 to 2016. Uh, I was uh, organizing these Babel camps, as, as Robert has mentioned. These days, it kind of survived in form of Babel talks which are uh, a, a, a de de derived from, the, from this big conference. And these are small meetups for social media professionals. Uh, there was one year hiatus uh, because of COVID, and, but we still plan to bring this back in some new form, which would probably combine uh, online and offline, online and offline events uh, together. Was it worth, uh, for me, it was usually like spending two months doing just this. And I'm not a good organizer of an event. And it was basically extremely stupid idea to do it on my own without much help. Like, yeah. <laughs> but it was definitely worth because uh, it helped me to get... Uh, to know people who were uh, the best of the best in social media in the neighboring countries. And they were happy to come. They were happy to talk for free. We only paid uh, their you know, travel costs. And it was all very, very low cost, <laughs> low cost game. But uh, it showed me Something that is again, I think, uh, transferable from like it doesn't have to be social media. When you have professionals in in Poland uh, who are you know uh, often speakers at conferences and so on, uh, 
they they would probably reject such an offer uh, if it would be in Poland, but they wouldn't reject it if they are invited to speak in the Czech Republic because it's something new for them because it has a totally different public. They are new for them. Uh, and we usually, like let's say in, in marketing, we usually tend to, if, if there's a conference, it's usually comprised of the local bunch of people and then one extra speaker from big company and that's from UK or US. Uh, marketing festival is uh, a, a very nice example of doing it totally differently and, and bringing top people from around the world. And top people doesn't necessarily mean the most famous speakers. So that was that was very interesting. It also kind of helped me to uh, get to see events in other countries. And knowing, for example, the Polish social media conferences was a big advantage. When you use this experience uh, for your uh, local uh, uh, local work. So, yeah, one of one of the one of the examples which was mentioned earlier uh, was actually based on being in Poland for a social media conference in Poland, where I had the chance to learn about this platform, which was at that time only in Poland. Uh, but was kind of like, wow, that's that's something that, that definitely makes sense. Platform to connect brands and micro influencers in a way that that you can you know automate many of the tasks. Our our agency it's called influencer.cz, but but it's kind of you know uh, we are not uh, YouTube pimps. Uh, who would be, you know, taking care of uh, several fashion influencers or something like that? Uh, for us, the domain was bought at a time when there were no YouTubers, and influencers were journalists or lobbyists or, you know, uh, bloggers maybe. So we are not a, a classical influencer agency, but we saw the potential in automation of this stuff and so i approached them after after their lecture in, in during social media convent in gdansk in poland and i said well guys this is uh, um, i think that's a brilliant idea do you think about uh going you know global if you would think about the czech republic i i can connect you with some people uh, in Prague who are thinking in, in a very similar direction, and I believe it's it's just stupid to you know to do it all again when there is a platform that you can just you know kind of copy paste localize and profit. And in the end, uh, they approached me once they were going. Uh, to other countries, including the Czech Republic, and we became uh, became their partner for the Czech Republic. True is that uh, we did campaigns for Tesco, Heineken, L'Oreal, and so on, but uh, it never it never was our primary business. But it was something which was directly taken from this international experience and cooperation, which would otherwise probably wouldn't happen. The funny part about it is, uh, it also, of course, led to knowing some people from the company. And when one of the key accounts from Indahesh landed a job in just opened a TikTok office in Warsaw, and she was also she got she was also told she's she's in charge of the Czech Republic. I was the first Czech person she she kind of uh, thought of. So she reached out to me whether we would be interested in uh, 
taking part in uh, or signing for as, as a TikTok advertiser, which we did. And we also introduced her to other companies. So, uh, so it ended up with uh, several leads, not, not just us. And this, again, was basically because Facebook, TikTok, and many other companies like those big names, they don't have uh, local offices in, in Prague, but they do have quite big offices in Warsaw. And again, Polish uh, is, is very useful, even though English is the lingua franca for, for everybody in, in online marketing. Anyway, these days, uh, the our website, influencer.cz, uh, we, we didn't really have, have a website for a couple of years. I know it's kind of a sad story, but it's true. And when we finally decided to 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 finish it or or not finish it to to have one even though it's you know basically a one pager running wordpress and you know so on and i think it's quite ugly uh we decided to have it in english and over the last couple of months i can see the influx of inquiries which are based on the fact that uh, because it's in English, because it's about influencer marketing and the Czech Republic, we are being approached by companies from Poland, Baltics, Sweden, Germany that are looking for exactly this, influencer marketing in the Czech Republic. As usually influencer marketing agencies, they either they, they have a website only in Czech or they are not primarily focused on, on getting uh, the international public. And because of you know, the domain name itself, uh, it's something we, we will have to work on because uh, at the moment we do have leads, but we don't have people to, to, to work on it which is usually the, the better case for business than the other way around. Anyway, when I would come to some kind of conclusion, uh, these are a few, few hints. Uh, going for some kind of niche uh, is definitely way to go. Having... An English profile, that's, that's like a no-brainer. Uh, having the cross-border or international cooperation, having some kind of different language than just English, I think that's like, I was, I was trying to push it to, to, to many of my friends. Uh, for example, it's like quite a big bunch of my friends from Brno. They studied the French Lyceum uh, in Brno, and so they have perfect French. And I was like, "Come on, guys! If you if you want to, you know, uh, there's definitely somebody looking for French speakers with the local Czech background, uh, especially because French people are, you know." very proud of their French and French heritage and everything. So, okay, they do speak English in online marketing, but they do value uh, your perfect English probably more than, I don't know, Germans would do with German against English. And yeah, still France is big, so it's big market and there are probably more connections between France and Czech Republic than, let's say, you know, Czech Republic and Albania. But on the other hand, there's fewer Albanian speakers. So uh, uh, being able to have, you know, some very strange language could be, again, uh, very useful because the competition is basically zero. Learning or having this kind of international experience 
is always beneficial when it comes to, to working on local projects because it gives you a, a different perspective. Uh, you, you have the chance to, to grab the news from other sources than, than local people do. And that's, that's always, always a good thing. If you happen to create some kind of this gateway cooperation where you, you serve as a hub uh, or, or uh, you're, you're working for, um, for example, for a, for a Polish company uh, as their Czech proxy, uh, it's usually a very much long-term relationship because they, I would even say they, they, they need you more than you need them. Uh, one of our clients or partners is a Polish agency called Pro Automotive. They are specialists for um, all things automotive, uh, especially not, not for car makers themselves, but car part makers. And we've cooperated on, on different brands like Valeo, originally a French company, Philips, uh, I mean, Philips Lightning, so the Philips automotive part. Uh, and these days for their uh, client, which is called Profi Auto, and it's a, it's a network of uh, uh, shops and garages originally from Poland, now uh, uh, being quite big uh, in, in Czech Republic and Slovakia, especially in near Ostrava, they, they, they are everywhere. And they have had a lot of, previously a lot of Czech agencies. And I think the problem was that the people didn't speak Polish. <laughs> And uh, the thing is that if we have somebody, in this case, it's me, uh, Polish speaking, that definitely totally changes the way they, they treat us. And uh, it's working very well. And with Pro Automotive, they are simply, you know, I, I've helped them again, like uh, with my BMV experience to, to get a, a guy in Romania because... Uh, uh, the guy in Romania was my uh, colleague when taking care of BMW, and now he's helping uh, also with Philips because Philips only has Polish branch, and from Poland they are serving all the markets from Baltics to Bulgaria. So, so even finding like more people like this would would be uh, would be a plus. So, this is it. Uh, hope it was i hope it was not boring uh and i'm i'm i'll be more than happy to get on the question part mm -hmm.